and we are live and ready to go. Great, thank you. Welcome everyone to the afternoon session of the uh, September 28th uh, Landmarks Preservation Commission public hearing and public meeting. We are resuming this afternoon with item number five on our public hearing agenda, which is 134 Spring Street. This um, meeting is being uh, held via Zoom and live streamed on YouTube. So if you would like to watch the proceedings, you may do so at our if, by going to our YouTube channel and watching the YouTube video. Or if you'd like to participate in the hearing items, you may join the Zoom meeting. And the information for that is on the screen right now. And it can also be found on our website. And I'll go ahead now and turn it over to our Director of Preservation, Corey Harala, to take us through the afternoon agenda. Okay, thanks, Sarah. And we'll start with public hearing item number five, LPC 22-01928, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 486, lot 11, 134 Spring Street in the Soho Cast Iron Historic District. This is a Beaux-Arts style commercial building designed by Albert Wagner and built in 1895 to 96. And the application is to establish a master plan governing the future installation of painted wall signs. Hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Jackie, you now have uh, control of the presentation. Just click on the screen and you can advance the slides using your arrow keys. Uh, please state your name for the record and you may begin. Hello, everyone. Jacqueline Pudu Vallon, preservation consultant for this project. Uh, thank you, commissioners and landmark staff for hearing our application today. Um, Abby, I, I'm trying to advance and I can't. Tell me what button to press, please. So you need to click on the screen first. Yeah. There you go. Now you can do it. I, I did that. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so hello again. Um, as Corey just introduced us, this is a, a master plan proposal for a painted wall sign on the east elevation of 134 Spring Street. Um, as he described, it's a Beaux-Arts building in, uh, built in 1895 to 96 in the Soho Cast Iron Historic District. Um, it stands on the south side of Spring between Worcester and Green in, in this historic district. Its uh, east lot line wall is prominent, which you see here, uh, because of the low scale building next to it, which extends to the corner of Green Street. You know what, before I go too far, I should also mention that the architect, Angel Ayon, of Ayon Studio Preservation and Architecture is also here with us, as well as Roger Bitten, Bittenbender, who is the owner of the property. Um, what you're seeing here are just two views as you walk east on Spring Street. And just from, for some uh, historical background on the building, here are two historic photos. You're looking at the 1930s tax photo, which shows this wall very nicely and uh, the designation photo from the 70s. And just to give some um, historic context on this district, as you're all well aware, so I won't go deep into it, but here are some historic photos demonstrating that large painted wall signs are part of the history of this district as it was a commercial district with, with light manufacturing uh, from the mid to late 19th century and into the 20th century. Oops, excuse me. And just um, to give you some district context, here are some, oops, sorry, I'm messing up. Oh, um, here are some nearby uh, painted wall signs that are also approved by the commission. You're looking at um, a sign on Spring Street and three on Prince nearby. And some more district context, another sign on Green, Green Street, one on Worcester, Mercer, West Broadway. And on this slide, um, this sheet shows you the, uh, the building and the site plan and also its zoning, showing that the proposed sign meets zoning requirements. Here's the roof plan, which shows where the sign is in terms of the building's footprint. So here where I'm showing the, the little hand, this is where the sign is gonna be. This is the entire east elevation. Uh, here is Spring Street. It's a pretty long east elevation because this building, as you see, actually has an L-shaped plan. So it has another street facade on Worcester. So the, the side elevation of this building continues pretty deep into the lot because of that. Okay. 
And here's an elevation drawing showing the proposed, um, the, the proposed sign and elevation. The dark gray, uh, I'm sorry, the light gray area is um, <clears throat> showing us the, the um, area used for this calculation. And this is the, this is the uh, proposed sign here in the dark gray box. So just to go through the proposed criteria and measurements, the proposed sign um, would have a, the standard two inch border. It would be set back three feet from the front facade. There would be no regulation on content uh, within the designated space. Um, the term of the master plan would be 10 years. The total sign area would be limited to 14 and a half percent of the, of the visible facade. The um, square feet of the total wall area is 2,024 uh, square feet. The square feet of the proposed sign is 295 square feet. And uh, there would also be the obligatory tag for the company that does the wall painting. And that would be three by two underneath the sign itself. And now here's just some photo montages looking at uh, how this sign would appear as you walk east on Spring Street. So viewed from across the street and to the east, viewed from the northeast corner of Green Street, and viewed from the east, um, sort of mid block as you get down to the next block. And here it is viewed from two blocks uh, east at the southeast uh, side of, Mer of Mercer Street. And at this view, you also begin to see a, a painted wall sign that's also approved here. And the address of this building is um, 111, um, 111 Spring. You also see it in this view as you get um, now getting very far back from the building uh, viewed between Mercer and Broadway. So here's our proposed sign. Here's one sign that's existing. And oops, I'm sorry. Then that's it. And I welcome any questions or comments, please. Okay, thank you very much, Jackie. Do we have any questions, commissioners? Okay, Commissioner Jefferson, please go ahead. Commissioner Jefferson, can you just unmute yourself? Yeah. <clears throat> it says here that 20% um, of the visible wall surface, the coverage 20% of the visible wall surface. Does that mean that if it goes all the way through block, you still have 20% or how is that figured out? Visible? Well, mm -hmm. the thing is the, um, this portion, even though the building continues, you, you see there's actually uh, only a portion of, of this side facade, which you can see from the street because of these buildings that are on the side street block the rest of the east elevation of this building. Let me get you to a better photograph to show this. Right, so it's a very long facade, but we have always had applicants calculate the percentage in terms of its relationship to the visible portion of oh. the facade. You know, so yeah. That's why they're, you know, yeah. Yeah, so you can see, you see this portion of the facade, the facade continues on, but because of these, these buildings here, you can't see that from the street. Okay, so it's just a visible visible portion of that plane that you have 20% coverage. Co yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, other questions? Okay, I don't see any other questions, so why don't we move to public testimony and um, if you're and uh, and then we'll see if we have other questions after that. So if you're in the meeting and would like to testify on this item, please raise your hand so we can identify you. And we will start with anyone who signed up in advance and then get to anyone else. And everybody, whether you signed in in advance or not, should raise your hand so we can identify you. And I'm going to turn it over to Anthony Fabre, our director of intergovernmental and community affairs, to take us through the testimony. So we do not have any signups for this item and I do not see any hands raised. Okay, all right. So um, let me just get to, we have, uh, we do have some written testimony, uh, Manhattan Community Board two recommended approval of the application provided the Lemmerks Commission staff ensure that it conforms to regulations which is um, the sort of standard 
policy or practice that we've been applying to all of the wall signs we've been reviewing in recent years. And um, I believe that this does follow the criteria that we have been approving on recent applications. And Jackie, if you can confirm that, that would be great. To my, to my knowledge, yes. Okay, uh, Corey, maybe I should ask you to just confirm that. <laughs> I can go back to that one slide if, or if someone wants to go back to the slide where I list the criteria. Okay, so I think, um, this is the criteria and I, Corey's internet may have um, bopped out, but my understanding is that this is in accordance with the criteria that we have discussed in a public hearing and applied to all recent approvals. Okay, commissioners, do we have any final questions? Okay, so let's, I'm gonna start to request to unmute all of you. So please accept the request so we can close the hearing and begin our discussion. Oh, just muted somebody that unmuted. Okay, there we go. All right. Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? I so second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. Um, Commissioner Chen, would you like to start this one? Yeah, I was just uh, taking my daughter there uh, this past weekend and walking right past this building. Uh, I think it, this is very uh, 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 standard and typical of what we have done in the past and I think it's appropriate. Okay, thank you. Commissioner um, Devonshire. Yeah, I, I agree. This is... Uh, okay similar to everything that we've been doing along these lines. So I'm, I can approve it. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chapin? Uh, I agree. Commissioner Holford-Smith? I agree. Commissioner Shamir Barron? I do as well. Okay. Commissioner Jefferson? I agree. Commissioner Lutfi? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> I saw what you said, but <laughs> for the record. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. And Commissioner Bland. Yep, follows all the rules. Okay, great. So I think we have a consensus. And I think the other, uh, you know, I'm appreciative that they showed us the full context of, the, uh, and this is a case where we do see it in the context of one other approved sign, but you are a minimum of two blocks away. And after that, a much greater distance and both signs actually become obscured by the buildings and the streetscape. So I think in this context that the cumulative effect does not detract from the architecture on the streetscape or the streetscape. So we'll go ahead and make the motion. Commissioner Chen, would you be able to make the motion? To read the motion? Uh, I, let me read, let, let me find the- uh, Okay. On screen. Okay, hold on a second. Okay. Let me see if I can find it. If you can't, just let me know. Yes. Yes, I do. Okay, I, great. In the matter of uh, LPC 22-0128-134 Spring Street, Soho Cathay and Historic District, the application is to establish a master plan governing the future installation of painted wall signs, uh, noting the building style, scale, materials and de details among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Soho Cathay and Historic District. I recommend approval, finding that the painted wall signs are a traditional method of advertising that was historically found in this historic district, typically on plain second art <laughs> with exposed common masonry, common brick masonry, that the painted application of the signage will be in keeping with the traditional application methods and commercial character of, the, of painted wall signs historically found on buildings within this historic district that the sign will be located on at an undeveloped secondary elevation and will be pulled back from the primary facade by three feet. And therefore the sign will not detract from any significant architectural features of the building. That the proposed master plan will, per will permit a painted non-illuminated wall sign that covers less than 20% of the visible wall surface. A coverage percentage that's consistent with prior commission approvals that the combination of the placement and size of the sign will help it remain 
a subordinate present of the building and within the streetscape, regardless of the type of graphics or number of colors used within the body of the sign, that the sign will include a solid painted border, a, a typical feature of historic wall signs, that the, that the vendor tag will have a set location and size, and that the proposed master plan will be valid for a proposed period of 10 years, and the applicant will document every sign approved under the master plan, so there will be a record the commission can consider when reviewing the effectiveness of the master plan criteria. Great, thank you. Commissioner Devonshire, would you second that motion? Second. Thank you, and Mark, will you call the vote? Uh, yes, uh, Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Samir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lefty. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With nine in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll move to the next item. Thank you. Okay, the next item is hearing item number six, LPC 21-10703, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 625, lot 38, 23 8th Avenue in the Greenwich Village Historic District. This is a row house with commercial ground floor built in 1845. And the application is to legalize and modify a rooftop addition constructed in non-compliance with certificate of appropriateness 10-6193 and to install new window openings and a balcony at the lot line facade. I believe the staff will do a brief introduction before handing it off to the applicant. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioners Elizabeth Fagan, Preservation Staff. The architect will be presenting the proposed changes and legalization, but before the presentation begins, I wanted to provide some background information regarding the rooftop addition. In 2009, the commission reviewed and approved a proposal to remove an existing rooftop addition at this property and to construct a new larger rooftop addition. During that public hearing presentation, it was noted that the rooftop addition would not be visible directly across 8th Avenue over the primary facade. It was, however, noted that the addition would be visible from other vantage points as you move north and south along 8th Avenue. A mock-up had been constructed to document this visibility. However, those images are missing from the original file. So you will see later in this presentation a series of images from Google Street View in 2009 showing a mock-up. Uh, it's not 100% certain that this mock-up in these images was the final mock-up. However, they do serve as a reference point. Subsequently, in 2012, after the addition was constructed, it was discovered that the as-built conditions resulted in visibility over the primary facade, and a violation was issued for being in non-compliance with the original approval. So I'll now turn it over to the architect, Elizabeth Mickey, who's going to walk through the presentation. Um, so Elizabeth, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and state your name for the record and begin. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Mickey with Spivak Architects, and I'm representing 23 8th Avenue. So there are three main points that we'd like to discuss today. Uh, the first is the windows, new windows on the side facade, as well as the French door and Juliet balcony. Uh, the second is existing uh, terrace doors on the fourth floor, um, enlarging those. And the third is the violation that was just discussed. Uh, so 23 8th Avenue is directly adjacent to Jane Street Garden, um, which here is highlighted in red, leaving the side facade exposed. And you can see historically 23 8th Avenue was one of a continuous row of townhouses. Uh, on the left is a 1964 photo and on the right is 1940 tax lot photo. But by the 1980s, um, some of the townhouses had been removed, leaving 23 8th Avenue the last in the row, exposing the non-historic facade. So here on the right is the existing facade, which is just a blank stucco wall. And on the left is the proposed two new windows at the fourth, third and fourth floor, 
and then a new Juliet balcony and French doors at the second floor. And here on the floor plans, just to locate them on the far right is the second floor with the French doors and the Juliet balcony. And here you can see the owners uh, own a two foot parcel of land adjacent to the side wall. So the Juliet balcony would only be projecting over their land. On the third floor, the new windows, and on the fourth floor, um, a new window on the side wall, and we're also proposing to enlarge the care stores that are there. And so here you can see uh, the other property that uh, borders Jane Street Garden is 42 Jane Street, and there have been windows added on this side facade. So it's similar to what we're proposing to do on the blank stucco side wall. Um, so not only do these windows add light into the building, but we think they also add visual scale and interest to the building. And they provide the eyes on the street concept, which is just helping make the space feel more connected to the people, uh, which feels more safe. And here's just a few images of the historical uh, corner lot that you can see there was windows on both sides, the front and the side wall. So we believe adding windows to the side will relate more towards the historic corner. And this is close up pictures of that blank stucco wall where we propose to add the windows. And on the far right image, you can see the, the windows that are on 42 Jane Street. And we propose to do something similar here. So they would relate to the neighboring building, uh, make this space feel a little bit safer and more connected uh, and relate more to the corner lot. And here are just close up drawings of the windows that they would be aluminum clad exterior with wood interior. We propose to paint um, the wood trim green which matched the front facade of the building and the applied muttons. And same with the French door would be similar, similarly built with the applied muttons clad on the outside, wood on the inside, and then a painted uh, black steel post railing. And here you can see the front facade, the right is the existing, the left is the proposed. So you can see the Juliet balcony would stick out, but not past uh, their, the owned land by the owner. And on the top floor, the fourth floor, on the right, you can see the existing and on the left is the proposed widening of the terrace doors. And here are closer up images of the existing fourth floor terrace doors. And the more and large drawing showing we're widening them from five foot eight to nine feet. So there would be three panels. It would be a trifold door. But in addition to the change of the doors, we also propose to paint the cornice cream colored. And as well, there's these two really long vent pipes that we propose to cut down to 24 inches above the roof line. And we believe making these two changes will help address um, part of the visibility uh, items and make this fourth floor um, blend in more with the context. You can see here on the right is the proposed painting the cornice on the fourth floor green, the adjacent building on the right is also more of a cream color as well as the stucco on the fourth floor. So it makes the cornice line of the front facade read stronger. And by reducing the, the height of those pipes, it also brings less attention to that fourth floor rooftop. So to address the violation, um, here on the, on the left is the pre-existing plan and section of what used to be there. And on the right are the 2010 approved landmarks drawings. And you can see here this highlighted dimension is 16 foot one. So it was, it was approved at the time to be larger, closer to the street. But um, so then we compare the what was approved to what is actually built. And we found out that what's built is actually 15 foot two. So it's about 11 inches further back from the street than what the landmarks drawings showed in 2010. It is higher at the back end where you can see this five foot two is highlighted. It's a steeper pitch, um, but this isn't really visible from the street anyway. And we believe this is done for drainage and snow load. Um, so in totality, it's very similar to what was proposed. There are a few dimensions that are different, but it doesn't 
the dimensions that are built don't impact the visibility from this street. So here's just an overlay you can see in 2010 approved dimensions as built conditions and then on the far right is the overlay. So it's 11 inches further back and about 14 and a half inches taller than what was approved. And just for reference, the front facade, what was pre-existing, um, you can see it was raised up a little bit. And this is what was approved in 2010, which is very similar visibly to what was actually built. And here's an image of the terrace. Um, there is a railing that is there, it's not installed, but we do propose to install that railing, which is shown on this bottom left drawing. Uh, it is lower than the railing that was approved in 2010, but this does meet code. And these are the 2000, uh, 2009 mock-up photos that were discussed earlier or brought up earlier. So you can see here, there's a vertical post with these horizontal elements, and it's very much similar to what was actually built. The other view, zooming in a little bit, you can see there was a mock-up done, and, and we do believe this was the mock-up that was discussed in the audio recording from the Landmarks hearing at the time. Uh, and then on the right, you can see it's very similar to what was built. And a few more visibility images, uh, starting at one over here. You can see the pop-up from the fourth floor, but you can't see the terrace doors very clearly. From across the street, you also don't see the terrace doors that we're proposing to widen. Um, but we believe, like I showed earlier, painting that cornice will really help blend in the fourth floor to the context. Um, and then moving across, no matter what the height or dimensions are of this, you will see it because it is the corner lot. So you see it again here. Uh, and then something else we'd like to um, present is in 2013 and 2014, Landmarks approved two visible um, roof extensions. So on the left, you have the uh, installed visible railings and the pop-up in the back, which you can see we believe was painted white to sort of blend in with the white of the building behind it. Uh, and on the right is also the, um, the gray chimney and stair bulkhead that are visible that were also approved. So in conclusion, We'd like to, you to um, approve the new side windows on the non-historic facade. Um, also the terrace doors on the fourth floor, which are not visible from the street in, in most locations, except for from that, that corner view. And also we'd like to propose legalizing what was built um, as it was built by the previous owner. And this is recently a new owner trying to just um, not add to the, any of the non-conformance, but just realize what is there. So that, that is you. the end. Yep. Thank you very much. It was a very clear presentation. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Okay, not seeing any questions. I think we'll move to public testimony. And if you're in the meeting and would like to testify on this item, please raise your hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Anthony Fabre to take us through the testimony. Thank you. We do have three signups for this item. The first person that I'll bring in is Anna Markham. Anna, you should be in the meeting. You just have to unmute your microphone, turn on your camera if you wish to, and um, state your name for the record. Hello, everyone. Hold on one moment just while I um, get this situated. Hello, um, good afternoon, commissioners, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Anna Markham, and I am the Director of Research and Preservation at Village Preservation. I am speaking on behalf of the organization today. We do have some reservations about the particulars of this proposed design. The addition of the windows, French doors, and Juliet balcony to the non-historic facade overlooking the Jane Street Garden take a little bit too much private advantage of this public space. The Juliet balcony and French doors are inappropriate and not in line with historical precedents in the neighborhood. We echo CB2's recommendation that only three windows be approved. Additionally, we strongly recommend that the applicant reconsider the use of wood clad aluminum windows at the Plyde Mountains. 
we encourage the applicant to consider higher quality, more historically appropriate wood windows instead. Regarding the violation issued for the rooftop structure, we do think that painting the addition a light color as proposed could have the adverse effect to what is intended and make it a little bit more visible from the street. We recommend that the applicant uh, reconsider the green that they are employing elsewhere in the design as a possible compromise for the exterior color of the rooftop structure. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Anything? Yes, I'm prom I promoted Diego Robayo, and he should be in the meeting. You just have to unmute your microphone, turn on your camera if you wish to, and state your name for the record. Hi, everyone. I'm Diego Robayo from the Historic Districts Council. HDC finds the proposed irregular fenestration on the northeast lot line facade to be awkward. We would suggest simplifying the fenestration to be uniform in width and to be composed of only double hung windows. The Juliet balcony should also be narrowed to align with the masonry opening or eliminated. The proposed penthouse cornice color should also should match the main cornice on the primary facade. Our preference is for the cream color for both cornices. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the last sign up for this item is John Graham. John, you should be in the meeting. You just have to unmute your microphone and turn on if you wish to. Good afternoon, commissioners. John Graham for the VSNY. Regarding the first part of the proposal, we do not support the use of three different types of windows on the very visible north facade. We have no problem with the idea of cutting new openings in this previously concealed party wall. However, building, builders in the 19th century typically used either one type of window everywhere or one type of multi-light window on the primary facade and a less expensive one over one on the secondary rear facades. We also feel that the proposed use of three window configurations is almost the definition of the phrase draws undue attention to itself. We also note that the photos of 42 James Street, which the applicant just showed us, seem to show that in that building, they used six over six in each of the window openings, though it was hard to see the ground floor, the lowest floor window openings. Um, we recommend that the design be modified to make all of the window openings the same size and provide them with either nine over nine double hung windows matching the windows on the front facade, which will help unify the building or six over six matching the windows on the adjacent building. Regarding the second part of the proposal, the VSNY supports the proposal to legalize and modify the rooftop addition constructed in non-compliance with C of A 106193 for we find that the addition as built does not appear to be significantly larger than the approved design and would still meet the definition of minimally visible from the street. And that concerning the proposed change to the terrace doors on the fourth floor, that enlarging the opening will not require removing any historic material and that the section of the 2013 door frame, which can be seen above the parapet on board 22 is so small that enlarging the opening and extending the door frame will have no effect upon the overall character of the building. Thank you very much, commissioners. Thank you. Um, I do not see any other hands raised for this item. Okay, thank you. And uh, I think we do have um, a letter from the community board and it says, uh, that the community, I, I think Sasha and Anthony, it might be missing something. It says the community board recommends the installation of three windows on the north facade beside the Jane Street Garden. So I assume it recommended approval of everything else and a modification to those windows. That is correct. Okay. Great. I have confusion. Thank you. Okay. 
So let me turn back to Ms. Mickey and see if you'd like to respond to the comments we've heard. Um, we've heard mostly comments about the side uh, lot line window, but some about the proposed uh, cornice color, which I know you, you're proposing to change to address the visibility. Right. I, and I, in a, to address the windows on the side, um, if, in order to move this forward, if we could get approved just three windows and not the doors with the Julia balcony, I think that would be um, a good compromise. And I think we'd be willing to move forward with that okay. direction. Can, can you go back to that elevation or that view so we can? Great. OK. So all right, it may be the elevation. So we can just see the windows that you're proposing. Okay, I see. And so the community board was saying, uh, recommending that the French doors be a, a window to align, I assume, the one above. Okay. All right, thank you. Commissioners, any? Yes, Commissioner Jefferson, please go ahead. I just had a question on this elevation. Um, is that the fireplace that I see outlined on the right hand side by the Yes, and it projects from the facade. So, so the the balcony is very close to the to the uh, chimney flue coming out, right? Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, other questions? Okay, then I think we're ready to start our discussion. So, I'm starting to request to unmute you for you to unmute yourselves. So, <laughs> look for that request. And um, Commissioner Chapin, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? OK, so the hearing is closed, and we'll begin our discussion. And perhaps we could go to, for the purpose of the discussion, the sort of view in the streetscape of the that long view that um, shows it in the context of the garden and the visibility. And so um, as has been presented, a previous owner um, came to the commission and uh, got an approval for a rooftop addition. And the current owner um, is proposing to make changes to that addition and to, to do lot line windows. In looking at the addition and trying to understand its compliance, it seems that it is actually set further back from the front facade than the approved drawings uh, indicated the addition would be. So it's set back further. And based on this mock-up that we found in Google Street Views that correspond to the date of that approval, it seems that this addition matches the visibility of that mock-up in almost every way, except for over the primary facade. And so to address that view over the primary facade, the applicant is proposing to paint the cornice white to help the whole thing recede, which would be similar to the treatment of additions approved further down this row, in this row um, that are also visible over the primary facade and to reduce the height of the flues. And then um, the proposal includes the, the lot line windows facing the garden. So Commissioner Jefferson, would you like to start this one? Yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> I will start with the, um, with the north, north east facade. And I think the, the windows should be simplified. They should just align and be simple. Um, I think the window types should Maps be the same, and I do think that the um, the, <coughs> the Juliet balcony is too long. It should set back to fit the opening. I think it's a it, it impedes too much with the fireplace. Uh, so those are my comments on that northeast facade. Okay. On the front, on the on the, um, on the uh, uh, cornice. If you look at this elevation on the right-hand side, 
the colors should be painted white because it just fits in with the fabric. The brown somehow detracts from the fabric of the block. And I, and I think the, the painting, I, I think painting the, the building, the new addition uh, white is just, I don't, maybe if you paint the cornice white and you paint the addition the same color or a kind of a lighter value, they would blend into each other better than what I see here. Uh, in terms of the back, um, the violation is acceptable. Definitely, it doesn't it doesn't offend me in terms of proportion. And I think the the three windows in the back are fine. I think they don't encroach too much on the proportion. Okay. So just to, to be clear, you were saying you were recommending that the uh, cornice on the main facade be painted. Yeah, because if you look at this elevation, this the block, the whole block here on the right hand side, you see how the cornice of the other yeah. three is a white. And okay. if you continue that across, it just makes sense in terms of the fabric. Yeah, I I agree it would fit it would make a more unified row. However, that paint color is not a subject of a violation. And so it's legal and they're not proposing to change it. Okay, that's fine. I mean it's just would be yeah. the fabric. In okay. terms of the addition in the back then, the color, the white color then, the too much um, vibration between the two colors. So maybe the addition itself should be painted another color, a greenish color or something, so it blends in. So that whole recession is blended better. Okay, thank you. All right, Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes. Um, I think that in the legalizing the rooftop um, addition makes sense. And the fact that there was already something approved up there and that the, the proposal does not seek to expand that, but rather um, is, is kind of further back than its furthest edge, I think means that what they're proposing for the rooftop is acceptable and appropriate. I am opposed to the lot line windows as they've been proposed the, the number of them, the difference in their configurations. Um, so I think if, if one of those windows, balcony, either balcony or the windows was proposed, I suppose that would be all right. Alternatively, if three of them and much smaller versions of them um, so that they would read as kind of secondary was being, was an option, I think that I could see that as a possibility, but as it's presented now, I think it's inappropriate. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Halford smith um, As to the addition uh, violation, I think that the configuration of the addition is close, is very close to what had originally been approved. So I can approve the um, removal of the violation for that. Um, I think that the cornice of the addition should be painted a lighter color. Um, I, I agree that, that the, it would be nice if the main corners of the building could also be painted a lighter color, but I know that's not before us right now, uh, but we can suggest it. Um, the side lot, side elevation windows, um, I agree, there's, they're, they should be consistent, one type. Uh, I don't think they should be French doors or the Juliet balcony. I think three, six over six windows would be acceptable of the same size. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yeah, I agree pretty much with those comments. Uh, I think that uh, the uh, lot line windows, they're atypical in this case. I think they could be permitted, but they all ought to be the same size, similar to what was done on the na uh, neighboring building. And I, I think just not have the Juliet uh, window. Uh, also, I think that the um, in general, I can approve uh, what's being done in the front to minimize the uh, appearance by lowering the flues and making it the addition corn is a separate color. I think maybe something like a light gray. I agree with uh, Commissioner Jefferson's comments and others that the white is a little, you know, well, it is it, it, drawing too much attention to itself, but it does need to be separated so it doesn't appear to be part of the the uh, building cornice. So uh, it, some 
you know, less less prominent color. And I'd suggest maybe, a, as I said, a grayish color might, might work. Okay, I, Corey, I, correct me if I'm wrong, that the color, or actually the applicant can correct me, the color that they're proposing is not, I think, intended to be a stark white. I think it's intended to blend with the sort of cream color of the addition. Is that correct? Correct. So, so that cornice-like element of the addition, the proposal already is to match the color of the rest of that addition. So it's not a white. It, it's that same sort of beigey cream color. Uh, that's for the cornice of the addition, not of the building itself below. Okay, and if that does, yeah. I don't know if that addresses your concern, Diana. Yeah, probably. I think it's uh, we were all be a little concerned that it might be, you know, be too uh, too too stark. As long as it's kind of a no a neutral. Neutral. Color. Okay, yeah. sort of toned down neutral. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, Commissioner Devonshire. Yeah, I'm I'm actually. Actually, okay with the color that they're proposing there. I'm all right with the uh, the addition itself, the, the curing of violations. I am opposed to uh, um, the Juliet balcony door. I think all those windows should be the same size, and they should should be secondary windows. There can be three of them. Okay. Thanks, Commissioner Chen. Yeah, I think we're uh, we are in agreement with the rest of the commissioners. Okay, Commissioner Bland. I think I'm in the same place. It's all fine with me, including the color, uh, except for the Juliet balcony and the, and the uh, French doors. That should just be a window, like the other two. Okay, and Commissioner Lutfi. Yeah, so I think the window should be should all match and the six over six, I think is uh, probably the right size and configure, you know, just configuration for those. I happen to think that on the front, um, the, I know I would agree about the painting of the, the white on the cornice. I know that's not before us, but I think this light color of the building um, in general, makes it show more. And I think the whole thing should be a gray, not light, light gray, like maybe a medium gray. Uh, and then it, then it, I mean, it's gonna stick out, but not any more than what, than what was there before or, or, or what, what uh, we approved. But I think it'll just blend more with what the tops of rooftops are like. Okay. All right. So I think what we can do is we can make, an, and I'll do this, a motion to approve with modifications um, that the final cornice and addition um, color be revised or restudied in consultation with the staff to be as neutral and recessive as possible and in keeping with rooftop accretions and that the lot line windows um, be revised to be three six over six double hung windows or three small three matching openings um, with a six over six configuration so um, let me go ahead and do that okay in the matter of Docket number 21-10703-23 8th Avenue in the Greenwich Village Historic District, a row house with commercial ground floor built in 1845. This is an application to legalize and modify a rooftop addition constructed in non-compliance with Certificate of Appropriateness 10-6193 and to install new openings and a balcony at the lot line facade. And I recommend approval with modifications uh, first noting that the building style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Greenwich Village Historic District. I recommend approval with modifications, finding that prior to the construction of the current rooftop addition, the building already had a smaller, partially visible rooftop addition, and that there are other partially visible rooftop additions and accretions within this row. Therefore, the presence of an addition is not foreign to this building or streetscape. That while the rooftop addition is modified 
moderately visible directly over the primary facade and from 8th Avenue to the north and south. It is simple in design and typical of other rooftop additions in the district, therefore does not call undue attention to itself. That painting the gutter and fascia at the addition in a neutral um, co color in conjunction with reducing the height of the vent pipes will help these installations and the overall presence of the addition recede from view. That the existing doors at the addition are minimally visible and will be minimally visible and therefore their enlargement in width will only be minimally perceptible. That the north lot line facade of the building was not originally exposed and became visible only after the demolition of buildings in this road to the north. Therefore, the installation of lot line windows will not disrupt a designed facade. And that the installation of multi-light windows will be in keeping with other lot line windows that face the garden and will recall the configuration of this building's historic windows and that the work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the building or the Greenwich Village Historic District. However, I recommend that the applicant um, work with the staff to revise the lot line windows to be three matching windows with a six over six configuration and that the, uh, they continue to work with the staff to choose the final color for the cornice and facade of the rooftop addition. Okay, so with that, uh, Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. Thank you. Mark, will you call the vote? Uh, yes. Uh, Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Ann Holford Smith? Oops. Aye. Uh, nine in favor, none opposed. The motion passes. And, and if it wasn't clear when I was reading it, that uh, action, that motion did not approve the Juliet balcony. Okay, we'll move to the next item. The next item is number seven, LPC 21 09885. An application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 893, lot 271, 134 East 38th Street in the Murray Hill Historic District. This is an altered Second Empire style row house designed by DJ Jardine and built in 1868 to 69, and then altered in 1958 by Thomas F. Hennessy. And the application is to install shutters and a flagpole. Hey, Commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Uh, Michael, you now have control of the presentation. Please state your name for the record and you may begin. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen of the commission. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Michael Popak. I'm the managing partner of a New York office of a law firm called Simpano Patricius and Popak. And um, I'm the owner or co-owner of the building and we'll be occupying it for our law firm. And I'm joined with our architectural representative Jocelyn Esaias to answer any questions of the commission should they come up. We acquired this Murray Hill row house from a former music publishing company in September of 2020. It is one off the corner of Lexington. It is the brown one that's uh, listed there. Let me just see if I can get control of the panel. Um, okay. I'm sorry about that. Okay, there we go. Yeah, it is the, uh, the one in Brownstone directly uh, uh, off the corner of Lexington. We chose Murray Hill and, its, uh, and this Brownstone intentionally because of the nature of the work that we do as a law firm. Uh, we have as part of our firm a national security and diplomacy practice. So being in the heart of Murray Hill and the United Nations and all of the diplo diplomat row was very important to us. We are respectful of its history and the legacy, and um, it, it's um, something that we will continue to contribute to in the neighborhood as a good neighbor. And we wanna be more. We wanna restore the building to the grandeur that it once had um, by adding two restorative additions. One, a flagpole, uh, which I will show next, and the other um, shutters. If I can get this to work, I'd be doing a lot better. 
So here is the um, elevation showing on the right, the 1980 tax photo, which shows the building with shutters, which have been listed on the Murray Hill report as historic, a flagpole. And frankly, that's exactly where we want the building to return to with our design. So we're going to have, we're asking to have shutters almost identical to what's in the 1980 photo and a flagpole directly at the location where it's located there. Um, and if you look at our neighbor, which is directly to the west of us, they have exactly that configuration. So we'd be continuing that as well. Um, looking at our building through time, the 1940 tax photo did not have the shutters nor flagpole, but by 1980, and certainly at the time of designation of the neighborhood as a historic district, it did. And then you can see in the 2001 photo, uh, it picked up a, a color that we're not gonna continue with. We're gonna stay with the brownstone, but you can see our neighbors there and all five of these row houses were built at the exact same time in 1868 to 1869. I think ours is the closest to what it probably looked like back at the day, but that's where we are. Um, as we said, let's see if I can move this ahead here. I apologize to the panel. I'm just having trouble running the PowerPoint. So there's a connection to history of our, our particular uh, row house. Both um, a member of the Lincoln family and John Quincy Adams Ward lived in the home. John Quincy Adams Ward is a preeminent American sculptor. He created the first sculptor in Central Park, the statue of George Washington at Federal Hall on Wall Street, where he took the oath of office. He also did all of the uh, sculptures and um, uh, statues that adorn the New York Stock Exchange. And he lived in our building. So we would like to have a flag flying the American flag right at that location, consistent with also our particular uh, line of business as a law firm. The Murray Hill District Report in talking about this five uh, row houses also noted that the wood, wood window shutters, which we are going to restore with approval, are historic and also referenced as of the date of designation, the non-historic flagpole and a bracket at the second story, which is exactly where we're asking for permission to restore. Also on the National Register of Historic Places that was filed for the Murray Hill Historic District, we have the same reference to the window, uh, the wood window shutters. Um, we're not the only uh, row house or brownstone that has shutters in the neighborhood. There's our 1980 tax photo, 2001, we certainly had it. Our next door neighbor currently has it. Two other locations near us show shutters. The flagpole also, primarily because we're sort of right in the heart of the United Nations consulates and embassies. And so here's two examples of flagpoles and flags of other nations. If I could advance the slide one more time, you'll see something else. I apologize. And right uh, catty corner, directly catty corner to our building is the Cuban consulate in New York on the corner of 38th and Lex. We look at it every day. They fly their flag. We would like a pole to fly the US flag. And um, I'd like to just go back, if I could, to a minute just to show the elevation that we're proposing. There. So that is our, um, we're showing there the, um, uh, the how the uh, shutters will be attached, size and shape, color, and the flagpole as well. So with the full support of the community board six, we're asking to have the commission here allow us to have shutters and flagpole. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Yes, Commissioner Devonshire, please go ahead. I'm just 
Thanks, Sarah. I'm, I'm just curious, has the applicant or has anyone on the staff confirmed that the shutters next door are bifold shutters? Commissioner, I'd be happy to answer it if the staff doesn't know the answer. I think I do. Well, you please go yeah. ahead and then when they can have the staff follow up. Okay. I, I don't believe they are. I don't think they're functional. I believe that they are, you know, you would not be able to close over the window. I think our goal was to have them be functional. Thank you. That's the staff's understanding as well. They appear to be sort of face fastened onto the facade or with concealed fasteners, but no uh, uh, real or fake shutter uh, hardware that we could see. Okay, Commissioner Plan. Okay. Oh, I'm, sorry, I'm go ahead. If everyone does understand that if these shutters were closed, the central panes would not be protected. I mean, they're, they're just a pastiche. Right. Yeah, sorry. Yes, and if you can uh, please speak to any hardware that you're proposing or not. Yeah, um, on to the commissioner's uh, comment, we're not planning to close them. Um, and uh, we wanted them to be m more than a look unless the commission is inclined to tell us we're okay with it just being like our neighbor and just having it be the look of a shutter instead of a functional shutter. We, we'd have no problem with that either. But we, we try to be respectful of the of the appropriateness of the building, the surroundings and all. Um, as to the shutter hardware, I'll turn it over uh, to Jocelyn Asias, who's our architectural representative who's on the phone or on the call. Okay, thank you. Joss? Hello. Okay. Um, we are proposing a three hinges uh, per shutter. As you know, these are tall openings. And we are proposing mortise hinges and traditional hardware for all of the shutters, um, including the stays or the rat tail. These okay. would be designed. So they would, they would have hardware, but that you wouldn't actually close them. You could. They're designed to be operable. Okay. I'm not planning to close them. Okay. All right. We have a few more questions. Commissioner Bland. Well, that, that was my question too. And I just, I think it's such a significant issue that I just wanted to be absolutely sure we were hearing it properly because visually it's clear that um, as Michael Devonshire had suggested, if they were closed, they wouldn't close them. They wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't, close over the entire window, they would leave a, the, probably the center panel open, which is a very strange and unusual situation. I'll leave it at that and I have comments later, but I just wanted to be sure that I was understanding the proposal. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chapin. Commissioner Chapin. Just, I wanted to clarify uh, with the staff. Um, on this block, these shutters were installed approximately 1980, at least the ones we're looking at, I'm assuming. One, are there a lot of other shutters on the block? And number two, uh, you know, they, this is just a decorative feature installed in 1980, right? It doesn't have, there's no uh, particular historic uh, reference for shutters on these buildings that we're aware of. Yeah, so um, we don't know exactly when they were installed, but what we do know from the report is that there were, you know, two generations of alterations to these original row houses, one in the earlier part of the 20th century, and then one, I think, 1958. And from the early 1940s tax photos, I believe that these shutters were not in place, the, the narrow shutters that you see at this building and its neighbor. And uh, they were done sometime after that, perhaps dating to that 1958 renovation. So the report does call them historic, but also in law, when it's characterizing other things that happened in that 1958 uh, renovation, they're also kind of noted as historic. So I'm not sure that necessarily means significant or not. It's just saying it was from that period. So. The narrow shutters are after the historic tax photo, very likely somewhere near 1958 or, or something along those lines. As to other shutters on the block, I don't believe there are a lot of them. There may be a few instances. I don't think currently in this grouping 
uh, say perhaps one, but they certainly don't exist uh, in, in a sort of a cumulative way anywhere on this particular block. And I think the examples the applicant showed may be nearby and in the historic district, but not, uh, again, not as part of this row for certain. Thank you, that was my impression, thank you. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions at this moment. So we'll move to public testimony and we may have more after that. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Anthony Fabre to take us through the public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand so he can identify you. And we'll start with anyone who signed up in advance. Okay, go ahead, Anthony. Thank you. We have two signups for this item. The first person that I'll bring in is John Graham. Okay, John, uh, you should be in the meeting. John, you can go ahead and uh, be in your testimony. John, uh, you are still muted. Okay. Uh, good okay. afternoon, commissioners. John Graham for the Victorian Society of New York. The application for work at 134 East 38th Street has two elements. The VSNY supports with modifications the installation of wood shutters at this row house. This building had shutters at designation and wood shutters are a typical addition to row houses altered in the 20th century. However, because the shutters which were there at designation didn't conform to the size and shape of the historic arch-headed windows, their removal now seems fortuitous. The applicant should be required to modify the design with new shutters fitting the width and height of each opening and having arched heads conforming to the shape of the openings. We believe that the shutters should also have a panel design instead of the proposed louvers, but trust that staff working with the research department can guide the applicant on this. The flagpole shown in some of the photos isn't mentioned in the designation report, so we aren't sure if it was there at designation, but we have to regard its removal as another fortuitous change. We recommend denial of the proposal to install a new flagpole at this building. We understand that there are some row houses which are now consulates and embassies in this area which have legal flagpoles. We know that there are some grandfathered poles, but flagpoles are not typical features of buildings built as private houses. They are an obtrusive element on the streetscape. They draw attention away from the protected features of this historic buildings and their use should be discouraged. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. Um, the next person that I'll bring in is Diego Roballo. Diego, you should be in the meeting. Thank you. Diego Roballo from the Historic Districts Council. Uh, HTC finds the mounting of the proposed flagpole of the lintel above the parlor floor windows looks cramped. The original mounting location at the, at the second floor window, at the second window sill is more appropriate and easier to reverse. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we do not have any more signups for this item and I do not see any other hands raised. Okay, great. Thank you. And I'll just also note for the record that Manhattan Community Board 6 approved this application as presented as the applicant stated. Um, and so now I'd like to turn back to the applicant and see if you would like to respond to the comments that we've heard. I, I would, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, as to the flagpole, it was listed in the Murray Hill Historic District at time of designation. I agree with staff, I, if I were guessing, it would be somewhere between 1958 and 1980 that a flagpole ended up on that building. Given the historic significance of the occupants of our building, which we'd like to honor as well, and consistent with our law firm's approach uh, to practicing law and diplomacy and national security. And given the proximity to the Cuban embassy and other embassies, we don't think it would be a blight on the street. Instead, we think it would contribute and, and be an appropriate attribute um, uh, overall to have an American flag hanging at, at that location on the second floor level as noted. 
As to the shutters, we are willing to work with staff. If the issue um, that was raised by Mr. Graham was to have panel instead of louver, we'd be, we, we would support that. And if they needed to be uh, for appearance purposes over the arch, I think we could also support that as well. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, any final questions? Okay, I'm gonna start requesting to unmute all of you so that we can move to close the hearing and begin our discussion. Okay, Commissioner Lutfi, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. Um, we have the two components, uh, flag, the installation of a flagpole and the installation of shutters um, that are designed to match the adjacent, adjacent shutters, but would, and while operable, would not actually uh, conform to the window and would not cover the window in its closed position. So we have the question of whether the shutters is, are appropriate to a building of this age and type and, and given the alterations that have happened to buildings in this district over time. And, um, and then if so, what should those shutters look like? And then the appropriateness of the flagpole. Uh, Commissioner Devonshire, would you like to start with this one? Sure. Um... I actually have no problem with the flagpole. Um, I, you know, it, it could be that at some point in the past, this was a consulate. Um, clearly that flagpole has been there for a while and I, I almost an illusion to it being advertising for this firm. I don't have a big problem with it. Okay. I do, however, have, if, if I may say, when I see shutters like this, it makes me shudder. It's like the driving through a suburban uh, development and seeing an 18 foot wide picture window and it's got two little one foot wide shutters on either side of it. The, I think these shutters do need to uh, reflect the masonry opening. I think they need to be wide enough so that if they were closed, I know they're they're not intended to be closed, but at least if they were closed, you would you would understand what the shutters were for. And so they need to be wider so that they meet in the middle of the masonry opening if and when they're closed. Um, I I disagree with the testimony about the louvers. Typically, still in the 1860s, the uh, ground floor shutters would have been panelized because they were a security measure, but the upper stories would have been uh, louvered shutters to allow for ventilation. Okay, thank you. All right, Commissioner Chen. Uh, I'm the same here. I have no issue with the proposed uh, flagpole. Uh, I think it is appropriate uh, given the testimony of uh, <laughs> applicant uh, in the context of this uh, of the context uh, I do agree with Commissioner Devonshire about we need to restudy the, uh, the the shutter and uh, maybe a more uh, muted uh, finish and then uh, and then to redesign it uh, to adjust to the commissioner's uh, recommendation okay Commissioner Bland I do have a problem with the slide pole and couldn't support that. Um, I could support the the idea of shutters, but not these shutters. They would have to be not only have the proper hardware to be closed and operable, but also to be the right size so that they would close over the windows entirely uh, if if they were closed. So that the that suburban idea that I um, that Michael Devonshire painted for us, um, it, it, uh, which I agree with, I. I grew up in a way that people were doing that too. Um, so I sh shudder at that. So I think they should be, I think if they're gonna be there, they, they've gotta be the right, the right ones. Okay, Commissioner Lutfi. And we don't need a whole commission of shudderers, right? <laughs> so, so 
I happen, I think uh, Michael Devon here uh, put it perfectly in terms of the shutters. I'm completely on board with the change in the size and proportions of them so that if they did close, it would make sense in terms of the opening. And um, I don't think there should be a flagpole here. Okay, Commissioner Jefferson. I, I agree. Oh. I agree with Commissioner Devonshire on the function of the shutters. And I don't think we need a flagpole at this location. Okay, Commissioner Shamir Barron. Well, I think both situations, the shutters and the flagpole are maybe excessive or somewhat un unnecessary here. I really can't come up with a good reason for why they're inappropriate. Um, I think that the fact is that there might have been a flagpole on one if this was a consular building or otherwise and I think it's it's entirely appropriate for there to be a flagpole here. I also have seen these kinds of shutters that are sort of decorative in the village and one right here in Gramercy Park but I think we've also seen shutters where the windows are this close together and the shutters in their open configuration actually touch one another. So the shutters could in fact get bigger and also um, be uh, the right size for those windows, uh, it seems to me, maybe, <laughs> maybe, mm -hmm. or they may have to be bifolding. In any event, I, I think any, any version of these shutters is actually appropriate given the context here and the other, the, this, the, the adjacent buildings that have exactly these kinds of shutters. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Holford-Smith. Um, I think as to the flagpole, um, it, that to me marks the building as an official building, which it is not. And I think, so I think that's confusing, it should, it's not appropriate. Um, the shutters, I also find very odd in the fact that they are flat headed and not, not with an arch top. And so even if they did close, they are bifold. So they might close, but they have a, would have an opening on the top. So I think if um, we're gonna go with shutters, that they need to match the, the arch top configuration of the windows. Okay. Commissioner Chapin? Uh, well, the shutters are not uh, uh, essential to uh, the, the, this historic building. I think they could be appropriate, certainly, if uh, the applicant works with the staff uh, to follow the sorts of guidelines that Commissioner Devonshire suggested. On the flagpole, I agree with others that it is not appropriate because as uh, Commissioner Holford Smith just said, this is not an official building. An uninformed person might think this is a federal building in a, uh, an area where there are a lot of uh, consulates. And while you know we all are, are fine to be patriotic, it's not uh, in this context, I'm afraid that it's, it's particularly inappropriate because it would appear that this building had some official status, which it doesn't, it, it's a law firm. With regard to, um, recognizing the uh, uh, important people who have lived there, uh, a suitable plaque would be a good way of doing that and could be approved, I'm sure, by landmarks. Uh, so perhaps, and, and would be much more informative than just seeing a flag which would not tell people anything about uh, uh, the previous, uh, uh, you know, residents. So that's where I'm at. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and I think that brings us around to uh, all the way around. Um, and I, you know, I agree that um, I think shutters could be found appropriate here, given the context and the history of change to these buildings in this district over time. Um, and but they have to be real shutters that, as everyone has said, conform to and reflect the shape of the opening, the arch shape of the opening, and have uh, the right proportion so that they could close properly and be operable. Um, and it looks like um, we don't have enough votes for the flagpole. Um, we have a majority in opposition of the presence of a flagpole um, given the residential typology. And I, I agree with Diane, with Commissioner Chapin that I think you do wanna reflect the historic occupants, it, a plaque may be a better way to do that um, because then you could actually tell that story. So let me, um, let me go ahead and try to make this motion based on the discussion we've just had and um, we'll do a vote from there and see where we are. 
Okay, in the matter of docket number 2109885-134 East 38th Street in the Murray Hill Historic District, an altered Second Empire style row house designed by D and J Jardine and built in 18, 1868 to 69 and altered in 1958 by Thomas F. Hennessy. This is an application to install shutters and a flagpole. And I note that the building style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Murray Hill Historic District. I recommend approval in part uh, with modifications and denial in part. Um, so I recommend, uh, with respect to the shutters, I recommend um, approval with modifications, finding that the work will not alter or damage any significant architectural features that um, the proposed shutters, proposed shutters that match historic shutters would be in keeping with later alterations at this building and a neighboring building within the row in terms of material and placement and that the proposed installation of shutters is reversible in nature. However, I find that the proposed shutters do not recall historic shutters found at buildings of this type, style and age in terms of um, their shape, finish, and design and size, and therefore recommend that the proposed shutters conform to the masonry opening and reflect the arched configuration of the window opening, and that they um, be wide enough or bifolding so that they could close and meet in the middle, and that they have hardware that makes them operable. And we recommend uh, denial of the flagpole, finding that it's not in keeping with the residential scale and character of this row house. And um, I think let's do that and take a vote on that. Uh, so let me see, Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. Thank you. Mark, will you call the vote? Uh, yes. Um, Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutby. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. Nine in favor and none opposed. The motion passes. Okay, so that's approved in part and please work with the staff on the modifications to the shutters. We will. Thank you. We'll move on to the next item. Next item is public hearing item number eight, LPC 21-06251. Application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1166, lot one, 300 West End Avenue in the West End Collegiate Historic District Extension. This is a colonial revival style apartment building designed by Schwartz and Gross and built in 1916. And the application is to extend the rooftop bulkhead. Hey commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Um, John, you now have control of the presentation. Please just cl click on your screen and then you can use your arrow keys to move the presentation back and forth. Please state your name for the record and you may begin. Hello, commissioners. My name is John Gordon with Sook Design Group, uh, representing 300 West End Avenue for this proposal to extend the uh, one of the elevator bulkheads on um, 300 West End. You can see here in the photograph, this is the view from West End Avenue and the um, corner. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but the corner uh, on 74th Street is here. Um, we have a district map showing where the uh, Building is located in the district, pretty much in the center. Plot plan showing the configuration of the building um, on the street corner. And then the enlarged plan shows the, the rooftop of the building. Um, there are three elevator bulkheads on the building. There's the A-line elevator, which is at the bottom. Um, in the center is a service elevator, and the top is the B-line elevator. And the A-line elevator is the one we're looking at today and the one we're proposing to extend. And then further up the page, you can see a circle on the plan, which is the water tower, just for reference. We'll see that in some of the photos. So um, we built the mock-up on top of the A-line elevator um, bulkhead. 
And to show the proposed height, you can see in the photographs of standing on the roof, what the, mo um, the mock-up looks like and a 3D diagram of the three um, elevator bulkheads with the dashed lines for the, the mock-up showing the extension of the A elevator. The service elevator, which is in the center is already taller. Um, it has a stop at the roof and uh, the in these elevators, the equipment is on top of the elevator shafts. So these are, the the top of the each of these is where the equipment is located so we're extending the a elevator up one floor so that the the um, equipment room will be in the in that area where the mock-up is and the door there which is currently where the equipment is is will now be a stop at the roof so that the um owners uh, will be able to go to the roof to use the roof for um, um recreation we have a map here showing, which I'll get to on the next page, is the photos showing visibility. Um, we'll have two photos showing when you're standing on uh, 74th Street, one further down West End and one further over on 7th. Um, sorry, I got interrupted. Uh, the, uh, the last view will be further down 74th Street to the east. So I'll go to the next page. These are visibility. So we'll start at the um, top left is when you first walk along 74th Street um, to, from the west, you can see uh, just starting to see a little bit of the orange of the, the um, mock up there above the front facade. The second photo um, in the center at the top of the page shows a little bit of the visibility from across on 74th Street, but closer to the corner. And then the, the third photo at the top all the way to the right is when you're further down West End Avenue, there's a little bit of visibility in the foreground is the, one of the chimneys, which is right on the street facade. In the background behind it, you can see the orange of the netting. And then the, um, the, the fourth photo, which is in the lower um, left hand side of the page is when you're on 74th Street, but over past Broadway, you can see the fairway in the foreground. You can see at the top, the orange netting is uh, the proposed mock-up. Um, next to it is the service elevator. You can see there, and then a little bit in the foreground, um, further to the right is the chimney of the building and also the water tower, which is also much higher. Um, we are including this plan uh, of the building just to give a little bit of explanation of how the elevators work. Um, so we can explain why we're extending the A elevator and not the B elevator and the conditions of the service elevator. The service elevator is not an automatic elevator, so the owners can't ride it without um, staff helping them because the elevator doors on the service elevator swing open. They're not automatic doors, so it needs an elevator operator to um, operate that elevator, and it's used primarily for you know, large furniture deliveries, things like that, because it's the only way to bring large items up to the apartments. And generally in the building, the apartments are two per floor. There's an A line on the south end of the building and a B line on the north end. The B line actually has sort of a public hallway at one of the upper floors. So people on the B line can take the elevator on the B line up to that upper floor and then just walk up the last few flights to the roof. So they don't, there's no need to extend the B B elevator any taller, but the A line is so uh, you know this full half half of the floor here, um, and they would need they have no way to get to the B side, um, so they would take the A elevator to the roof. So that's the logic of why we're extending that one. And then, whoops, sorry, then we just have some more details and elevations of the um, of the construction of the elevator bulkhead. You can see in, in this uh, elevation view here, the comparison of the three elevator bulkheads, just for reference. It'll be a little bit taller than the service elevator because the, um, the door is gonna be slightly above the roof for a proposed roof deck. And then the service elevator actually stops below the roof and there's a couple steps up to get to the roof from its landing. So I'll flip back to the mock-up page. Thank you. The uh, presentation has concluded. Great, thank you very much. All right, commissioners, do we have any questions? 
All right, let's move to public testimony and uh, we'll see if we have anyone to speak on this item. And I'm gonna turn it over to Anthony Fabre to take us through the speakers. Thank you. We do have some signups for this item. The first person that I will bring in is Sean Corsandi. Sean, you should be in the meeting. Good afternoon, Commissioner Sean Corsandi for Landmark West. The Landmark West Certificate of Appropriateness Committee did not find anything nefarious about this application. While unfortunate that the extension will be visible, we support this if kept to the needed minimum. Our committee does request clarification on paint color for guardrails, stairs, and platforms. Thank you. Thank you. The next person that I'll bring in is Diego Roballo. Diego, you should be in the meeting. Thank you very much. Diego Roballo from the Historic Districts Council. HTC finds the proposed replacement balconies to be awkward and overly clumsy in their fenestration and detailing, a situation that is amplified by the first floor unit that remains unchanged. We would ask LPC direct the applicant to replace right, the- Diego, I think this, this is the uh, second next item that you're reading, right? Uh, this is uh, 330 West End Avenue. It's 300 West End Avenue. Oh, okay. All right, <laughs> sorry about that. So we are not commenting on this one. Okay. okay. Um, so the next person that I will bring in is uh, Michelle Parker. You should be in the meeting. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. Michelle Parker, Community Board 7, co-chair of our Preservation Committee. Our uh, board found this, uh, did I say CB7? I don't know if I said Community Board 7. Our board uh, voted in favor of this application, finding like Landmarks West that you could see the proposed addition a little bit way east, but that it comported with the historical nature of Community Board 7. Um, a particular historical note about this building is that Harry Belafonte bought it in the uh, mid 1950s because he and his family, in part, because he and his family could not find a place to live. Not, they were discriminated against from living any place. So he went up and bought the building and then converted it to condominiums a couple of years later. And to this day, many prominent artists live there. So um, that's our historical note about this building. And we are in favor of the application. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do not see any other hands raised for this item. Okay, great. Um, and let me just note the community board. Uh, well, we just heard, I think, got that one. Okay, so we don't have any other letters that haven't been represented by speakers today. Um, so the, it seems um, that the, app, this, the testimony is supportive, except there were some questions uh, from Landmark West that maybe you can address. Yes. Um... Well, and I didn't mention about the, the brickwork either. We tend to use the same color brickwork that's there, which is sort of the blended red brick uh, matching the historic character of the other bulkheads so that it's just consistent. But the other question was about the paint color for ironwork, such as railing. And the intention is to use black. I think that's the simplest uh, thing to use. It matches with the water tower structure, which is also steel. So I think that would fit in the best under the conditions we see. All right, thank you. Commissioners, any final questions? All right, I'm starting to send my request requests to unmute so that we can move to close the hearing. All right, Commissioner Holford Smith, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Commissioner Devonshire, would you second that motion? <coughs> okay. 
Was that a second? (laughs) (laughs) All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion to extend this um, elevator bulkhead. Uh, Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you start this one? Yes, uh, I think it's acceptable and really won't be, there, there's, there really is limited view of it. Um, and uh, I, I, I can't, I mean, it's required, it's necessary. So I don't have an objection to it. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Holford Smith. I agree, it's visible, but um, sort of falls in line with other accretions that you see along the skyline. So I think that it's Okay, Commissioner Chapin. Yeah, I, I think it's fine. I can approve it. Commissioner Devonshire. I think it's fine. Commissioner Chen. I'm here. Commissioner Bland. Um, continuing, I do too. Okay, Let's Commissioner see. Lutfi. Okay, yeah. Okay, and Commissioner Jefferson. I can approve this. Okay, so we have a consensus. Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you make the motion? Yes. In the matter of LPC 21062513 300 West End Avenue, West End Collegiate Historic District Extension, a colonial revival style apartment building designed by Schwartz and Gross and built in 1916, mm-hmm. the application is to extend a rooftop bulkhead. And I note the building style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the West End Collegiate Historic District Extension, and I recommend approval, finding the pro- that the proposed work will not eliminate or damage any significant architectural features, that the bulkhead enlargement will only be seen from public thoroughfares over primary facades in limited incidental views at a distance and over a secondary facade within the context of a streetscape with buildings of varied heights with a mix of rooftop accretions of equivalent size, that the bulkhead will only be increased in size, the minimum amount necessary to provide roof access and when seen from public thoroughfares will remain compatibly scaled to the building. And that the bulkhead's simple design and profile and typical materials and finishes will help it remain a subordinate and harmonious presence at the building and within the streetscape views. Thank you. And Commissioner Holford smith would you second the motion? I second it. Mark, will you call the vote? Yes, uh, Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With a vote of nine in favor, none opposed, the motion passes. Okay, so that's approved. Thank you. And thank we'll you. Move, thank you. We'll move to the next item. Next item is hearing item number nine, LPC 21 10227, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1167, lot 64, 330 West End Avenue in the West End Collegiate Historic District Extension, an arts and crafts style apartment building designed by Robert M. Farrington and built in 1915 to 16. And the application is to replace greenhouse structures on balconies. The commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Um, The staff will be doing the presentation. And staff, you now have control of of the presentation. Just click on the screen, use your arrow keys, state your name for the record, you may begin. Great. So Abby, just to clarify, the applicant has an- entered the meeting. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. This is Dina Posner from the preservation staff, and I'll be presenting this application for 330 West End Avenue. Um, and the applicant is here to answer any questions. The scope of the application is to replace greenhouse structures. Moment. The scope of the application is to replace greenhouse structures on balconies, which can be seen in the left-hand photo here. The right-hand photo shows the front facade of the building on West End Avenue. There are currently five greenhouse structures, all at an existing multi-story balcony structure. All were present at the time of designation in 2013. However, some were replaced more recently prior to designation. 
The greenhouses are located at the rear facade of the building. These maps show the location of the building between West 75th Street and West 76th Street. And the greenhouses are only visible through the alleyway that is around the corner to the north of the building here. And it is located past the rear facade of the neighboring corner building, which is 336 West End Avenue here. You can see the balcony locations noted there. These show additional views through the service alley. The proposal is to replace four of the existing greenhouses with new greenhouse structures. The third floor structure, which is the lowest one seen here, there at the bottom, is not part of the scope and will remain as is. This map outlines the locations that the following photos were taken uh, at to demonstrate the visibility as you walk down West 76th Street. Approaching from the left of the alley, the structures are not visible. Getting closer to the alley, the structures are still not visible. The right-hand photo shows that the structures are visible as you are standing directly in front of the alley. And then the left-hand photo shows that the visibility is quickly gone as you move to the right towards West End Avenue. And this is a photo that shows a view as you are standing up close to that entrance to the alleyway and looking up. The left-hand photo shows the third floor structure, which is not scheduled to be replaced right here. This is a structure that was replaced more recently prior to designation. The next few slides show some close-up photos and dimensions of the existing structures. And the next few slides show a few other additional views of the existing conditions from the interior of the structures. And the floor plans on these slides show at the bottom right corner show the relationship of the balconies to each of the apartments. This shows the existing and proposed floor plans. The proposed structures are constructed of a bronze finished metal framing and clear glass panels. Some panels at the sides and roof are operable for ventilation, which is the condition at the existing structures as well. The size of the proposed greenhouse in plan is the same as the existing. This shows the existing and proposed elevations for the right side of the greenhouses. And this shows the existing and proposed east or front elevation. And finally, this is an overall elevation showing the four structures here that are proposed to be replaced and the third floor structure, which will remain. That concludes the presentation and the applicant is here to answer any questions. So uh, Lisa and Gio, you may unmute yourself um, to answer any questions. Okay, great. Okay, Hi. all right. Hi. Hi. <laughs> is there anything you'd like to add at this point? And then we'll see if we have questions. Um, you know, it's, I think it's a pretty straightforward pro project. Um, you know, we did the best we could to demonstrate the goals. You know, Dina's been amazing. And, um, you know, we're just, we're just hoping to convey the approach, you know, as easily as possible. It's, it's a nice project. And when you're inside the balconies, the, the greenhouses, it's, it's a nice space. And I'm happy, I'm hoping that these new structures, they can actually use the balconies 24 or 12 months out of the year. Um, now they're drafty and leaky and stuff like that. So they're not utilized 100%. So they're trying to upgrade their environment. Okay, great. All right, commissioners questions? Yes, Commissioner Jefferson. And just accept the request to unmute. Uh, why did you change the shape? Well, the curved shape doesn't allow the top panels. Some, uh, two of the panels on the sloping surface for the roof are operable, and that's for maintenance as well. So with the curved option, they don't um, they don't offer that option. So they went with that angular shape so that they can maintain structure at the rooftop also 
along the sides from, you know, and it's, it's a four seasons product, um, products that were specific to um, exterior maintenance from the inside. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Okay, I don't see any other questions at this time. So we'll move to public testimony and I will now turn it over to Anthony Fabre to take us through the speakers. If you're in the meeting and would like to speak, raise your hand so he can identify you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the first person that I'll bring in is Sean Corsandi. Sean, you should be in the meeting. Good afternoon, Commissioner Sean Corsandi for Landmark West. The Landmark West Certificate of Appropriateness Committee recognizes these grand greenhouses are non-historic but grandfathered elements. We believe the new anodized bronze color will be more appropriate and other improvements more efficient. Our committee did wonder why the third floor is not receiving the same design and requests the applicants to consider the new design materials, color, and form as the standard for a greenhouse master plan for this landmark. Thank you. Thank you. The next person that I'll bring in is Michelle Parker. Michelle, you should be in the meeting. Thank you very much, Commissioners. Michelle Parker, Community Board 7, Preservation Committee. Our board voted in favor of this application una unanimously. Uh, we um, appreciate the fact that this art, these Art Deco looking greenhouses will now be built uh, to more historically match the 1915-1916 building they are attached to. And, um, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I do not see any other hands raised for this item. Okay, thank you. And I think Diego Robayo had something for this. He did, but I do not see him um, okay. in the attendees. Okay, but as I recall, what he was starting to say um, was that he thought the balcony, that they thought the balcony seemed awkward and clumsy in their fenestration and detailing. So, um, and then we also had a letter from the West End Preservation Society uh, recommending the applicants retain the original elements. So I, I don't know if they mean the existing greenhouses. Okay, so Lisa, would you like to respond to the testimony? I think the two speakers that we heard from were largely supportive, but there were questions about that third floor. And I think it would be helpful to understand how you see that. And you may have already said that. Dina may have already presented that, but if we could just revisit that. Well, the third floor was just replaced about 10 years ago. Um, and it's functional. It, it doesn't leak and it, it's, you know, year round usable. And um, it's in good shape. So the owner doesn't and if you could just take us to the, or Dina, maybe go back to the slide that shows the view, just so we can understand how you see it in connection with the rest of them. Yes, so I think what Lisa was getting to also is that these are each separately owned apartments. So the four um, owners are coming forward for replacement, the third floor owner is not. Okay, and just um, with your mouse, maybe you can just show where the, the third floor is. The third floor is, uh, no, it's a little bit lower. It's right above where the um, masonry entrance to the alleyway is. Okay, so it's the, the sort of lowest one in view, but it is obscured. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right, Commissioner Shamir Barron, please go ahead. I I'm just wondering if they replaced one of, one of them 10 years ago and it's in good shape and they make the, that exact type, what, the reason you're not proposing to, um, to use this model that was used 10 years ago is because it doesn't have this operability on the top. Is that, is that the only reason? Because I thought you said that it had to do 
with some other maintenance issues or unavailability? Um, it's also, um, the, the new proposed greenhouses have six foot sliding windows, whereas the one on the third floor, there's not that many operable panels. So the roof um, operable panels will help clean the roof and then the side operable panels will help keep the exterior side views uh, well maintained and clean. So there's more operable fenestration in the in our proposal than what they have on the third floor. Okay, other questions? Okay, I'm gonna start to send my request to unmute so that we can move to close this hearing and begin our discussion. And Commissioner Lutfi, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner mm -hmm. Bland, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the hearing is closed. Can we just actually go back to the previous slide? I think that was right, sort of looking up at them. So um, the proposal is to replace these greenhouse extensions with new greenhouse extensions that would um, be different in form. And except for at the third floor, which is in this view, not visible in connection with the others. And from across the street, I think it's a partially obscured view. And then none of these are visible as you move to either side of this opening. So it's a sort of a narrow gap or cone of visibility to begin with. Um, so let's go ahead and start our discussion. Commissioner Holford Smith, would you like to start this one? Sure. Um, I think, Given the limited visibility of these and the improved um, performance of the new design, that I can find it appropriate. Um, my apartment actually looks out on similar structures to the ones that are there now, and I can attest that they never get cleaned. <laughs> so as someone who looks at something like this all the time, I think um, having the improved performance and the improved ability to, be able to clean the glass um, makes it a win-win. So I can improve this application. All right, thank you. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with uh, Commissioner Holford Smith. Uh, uh, though I like the design, the original design, uh, I think that the performance issues uh, and the maintenance issues are important and the visibility is slight. So I can say this. Okay, Commissioner Devonshire. Um, you almost have to search these things out. Um, so they could do all kinds of stuff back there and it wouldn't bother me. I can approve this. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Chen. Likewise, yeah. Com Commissioner Bland. You know, these, these commercially available stock items that many different companies make, they're applied to suburban houses, to now to high rises in historic areas of New York City, they're not um, appropriate or inappropriate really uh, for this building at all. They're just simply there. But because of their <clears throat> uh, incredibly almost invisibility in the back, I, I think Michael Devonshire sort of hit it for me too. Uh, so I, had, I don't have any problem with changing out what's already there to make them more comfortable. Uh, and usable by the occupants. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Commissioner uh, Jeffers, uh, sorry, Jean, Commissioner Lutfi. Um, so I happen to agree that their invisibility makes this work, but I also would like to say, I've been on the inside of many uh, apartments that have them and they are, the fact that they're hard to clean makes them an eyesore soar within those apartments. So I think uh, this design is <laughs> a godsend for, for the people who have them so they can at least feel good about um, this extension on their uh, homes. All right, thank you. And Commissioner Jefferson? Yes, um, I love walking around the city and seeing slots and seeing things in slots and how different they are. I get a joy out of that. In this particular case, I think I can accept the, the I, well, I think the existing ones were quite lovely because they 
fit the slot nicely, but I can accept the new ones. But I do hope that 10 years from now, when they replace the third floor one, they replace it in kind. So we could have a consistent uh, slot. That makes sense. Okay, and uh, Commissioner Shamir Barron. No, no, I will mi miss them. I think it's, they're so sweet and strange to see. <laughs> um, and I wish we didn't have to agree to change them so that they could be cleaned. I understand though why that's important. Uh, not for its appropriateness, but I, I mean, as Fred said, these are neither, they're, they, you know, they're not actually historic, but they seem special. So um, yeah, I, I guess I can approve it. Approve okay. it. All right, great. Okay, so I think we're all in agreement. So Commissioner Holford-Smith, would you make the motion? Yes. In the matter of LPC 2110227, 330 West End Avenue, West End Collegiate Historic District Extension, an arts and crafts style apartment building designed by Robert M. Farrington and built in 1915-1916. The application is to replace greenhouse structures and balconies. I note that the building's style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the West End Collegiate Historic District Extension. I recommend approval, finding that the proposed work will not eliminate or, or damage any significant architectural features, that the proposed greenhouses, which will replace existing greenhouses of equivalent size, will be simply designed uniform in, in size and placement and well scaled to the balconies, helping them remain a harmonious and subordinate presence. That the work will only be seen from public thoroughfares at a distance and a limited incidental view within the context of secondary facades of neighboring buildings that the predominance of clear glazing will help maintain a sense of openness, typical of views into the center of blocks within this historic district, that the proposed materials and finishes will be in keeping with such aspects of greenhouse and other accretions just sometimes found at secondary facades of buildings throughout the historic district and help to differentiate the modern greenhouses from the historic masonry buildings, and that the work will not detract from the special architectural or historic character of the building or historic district. Thank you. And Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. Thank you, Mark. Will you call the vote? Uh, yes. Um, Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. <clears throat> Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With nine in favor, none opposed, the motion passes. Okay, so that's approved. Thank you. And we'll move to the next item. Very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, we'll now do the uh, next and last item of the day, item number 10, <laughs> LPC 21 08658, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan. Block 1869, lot 7502, 780 West End Avenue in the Riverside West End Historic District Extension 2. An arts and crafts style apartment building designed by George and Edward Bloom and built in 1912-14. The application is to replace windows. Okay, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Um, Alfred, you now have control over the screen. Just okay, click on your screen, just click on your screen. And then you can use your arrow keys to advance the slides. And just be sure to state your name for the record. And then you may begin. I'm on. Alfred Common, architect. I represent the, um, the shareholder on the 11th floor um, building, which we want to replace the windows. With that being said, I guess we'll start looking at the pictures. Show and tell. How do we do that? Okay. Okay, the, uh, oops, first page. Let's do one. We'll get there. Hold on. Okay, wait a minute. I'm not controlling it. Bear with me. Yes, you, you are. You can use your arrow keys on your keyboard to yeah, go back and forth. I'm trying to do it. It's not uh, responding. I guess I have to. How do we? Okay. Uh, 
want to get to the first page. Let's try it. <clears throat> uh, keep going. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Ah, uh, finally, we're going to get to the next page. How are we doing this? <laughs> You're going to have to do it this way. Well. Okay, it's let me do this. The arrow is not working. Yeah, my keyboard's not working. We're going to use the arrow. Okay. Page one. Would you like me to to move the slides for you? Yeah, that'd be great. That's better. Okay. I can't, uh, it's not responding on this side. I can do that. I can, if you can do page one, that'd be fantastic. But you can use this to point out. So Let me see. Here. Can... The pointer works. Uh, I want to do page A1. Uh, there you go. No, no, A1, stay there. OK, we have three photographs of the same building. First photograph is the tax photo of 1941. And then we have the designation photo of 2015. And then we have the present photograph of 2021. The tax photo of 2000, uh, 1941 indicates that the windows, they're double hung windows, but they're three over three. And the intent is to replace, the, while the other windows, both in 2015 and presently, uh, have been changed. The windows have been changed prior to the designation. So what we have now existing in most cases is a double hung window one over one. Now uh, the shareholder on the 11th floor wants to maintain a one over one double hung window. So basically, so the problem is that we now have a three over three that's required by designation, uh, but we want to change it. So these photographs indicate the uh, what what the present it gives you it gives you the flavor of what the building was. Let's go to two, which is a little more detailed. Now the the detailed photograph of the uh, tax photo, which will give you a better idea what the windows look like. Three over three. Uh, I also have a photograph of the eleventh floor corner of the eleventh uh, floor corner apartment, which indicates the windows that we want to replace. Also a plan designation of the windows and a section of, or actually elevation of the windows. Basically uh, we're taking out the entire window and replacing the frame and the uh, sash brick to brick uh, to match the existing, both in color and profile. So that's that on that sheet. Let's go on to the next sheet. That would be great. This is a section of the window that exists now on the left side. Uh, in, the, in particular, the brick mold um, is existing. We're not touching the brick mold. We're just replacing the window with the same profile and the same width. So um, on the right side shows you the window that we propose with the existing brick mold and uh, no change to the interior um, decoration of the frame. So that's that on that sheet. Can we have the next sheet? Um, this gives you an interior profile. It also gives you a, a better picture of what the, uh, the brick mold looks like. And it's a rectangular section and they have the profile of the window. And also what the window looks like uh, from the inside. So, uh, and of course the location of the window on the 11th floor. So, um, so that's basically it. So here we go, oh, next sheet. This gives you an idea. I walked around the neighborhood, see if I saw any three over three double hung windows. Um, there's far and few between. I couldn't find any. There's sort of a three over three is kind of industrial. Uh, but however, I just saw a lot of double hung windows, aluminum. So that's the flavor of the neighborhood with the windows. I thought I'd give you some insights into what I ran into. Okay, next sheet. Um, I, Let's see, let's start with this. Yeah, the back of the window, the back of the building also has the uh, windows replaced, except for the stairwell. The stairwell has fire rated windows, which are two over two, and they're rated windows. So that was uh, not part of the picture. I was able to find one remnant of a window that uh, it looks like the existing window is a wood frame window. It also has a uh, brick mold, which is a sort of rectangular brick mold. So that's basically what I'm hanging my hat on as far as brick molds go, is the uh, pre-existing. And that was it. That's the only window that exists. Interesting. 
So my request is that we replace the window in kind one over one. And uh, now, by the way, this is only for the 11th floor. Um, the uh, shareholder just elected to do his windows only and not the way general the window profile change for the entire building. And uh, that's my story. Okay, thank you. Okay. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Yes, Commissioner Lutfi. Just un just unmute yourself. I'm I'm not. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure. I see any of the three over three windows here. Um, it's hard to see. If you look at this photograph, um, yeah, I think page two gives you a better. Oh yeah, right. It's, if you look at it very closely, you'll see three over three um, double hung windows. So they, they, they do not currently exist and did not at the time of designation. Oh, no. uh, oh, oh I, I understand. Okay, I understand. Yeah, they, so, now, uh, so is the building completely one over one except for those lot line windows? Um, yeah, yeah, the whole building prior to the designations that the windows have been replaced in most cases. If you look at the uh, page one, they are there are some in some instances there is a split split to uh, double hung but in most cases the uh, uh the, in particular the 11th floor which i'm focusing on they're one over one and they're not split like um in some cases you'll see um for example here there's two double hung windows but they're split mm -hmm. they're split here but you know if you look at the 11th floor here they're all double hung and, and here again, uh, it just is the same a photograph mm -hmm. here, up here. So I have another question. Um, yes. Are the windows all aluminum windows? Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, other questions? Oh, I have yes. another question. Go ahead. <laughs> Who, uh, who's the window manufacturer that you're um good question i don't have the answer all i know is we have a profile window that um universal window and door model 555 is on the drawings okay thank you New aluminum heavy duty windows um, again it's a low e insulated double pane window okay okay and and maybe just to sort of follow up to answer a couple of your questions, just on the question of the material, as you may know that the the, um, the rules that allow for staff level approval would allow the staff to approve an aluminum window on a building of this size if it matched the original configuration and details and finish, meaning the color. So um, that may help in your thinking about this. This of course is before us because it, it doesn't match those details and configuration. And, um, and then just in terms of the window manufacturer, we as a city agency can't require a specific window manufacturer, but certainly we do see, prof we approve profiles and details and those may be um, proprietary to some ma a particular manufacturer, but we'd be approving it based on those details. Okay, other questions? All right, let's see if we have public testimony. Um, if you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand so we can identify you and I will turn it over to Anthony Fabre to take us through the testimony. Thank you. We do have some signups for this item. Um, the first person that I will bring in is Sean Corsandi. Sean, you should be in the meeting. Good afternoon, Commissioner Sean Corsandi for Landmark West. The Landmark West Certificate of Appropriateness Committee appreciates this resident's interest in replacement windows. When reviewing this application, we couldn't help but think of Matthew McConaughey as he accepted his Best Actor Award for Dallas Buyers Club. All right, all right, all right. While replacing these windows in kind might be all right in itself, it is eyes wide open, not the original three over three or two over two double hung windows of the original plan. 
Thus, it is the wrong design, not all right. While the rationale is that, quote, to revert to the historic configuration would result in an interruption of the facade's aesthetic continuity, end quote, that thinking is not all right. If these windows truly need to be replaced, their neighboring windows are likely not far behind. Will each of these repeat the mistakes until the facade is forever all wrong, all wrong, all wrong? Correcting this facade will undoubtedly take time. Why not let these windows be the start of something right? All right, thank you. Thank you. The next person that I'll bring in is Diego Robayo. Diego, you should be in the meeting. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Diego Roballo from the Historic Districts Council. HDC asks LPC require the building to develop a master plan for window replacement that will allow this applicant and subsequent applicants to replace windows over time in a consistent and appropriate configuration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next person that I'll bring in is John Graham. John, you should be in the meeting. Good afternoon, commissioners. John Graham for the VSNY. There is an historic tax photo of 780 West End Avenue on the left side of board A2. When we examine this photo closely, we could see that the original double hung windows on the street facades actually had three configurations. There are one over one, double hung windows for the small bathroom windows. There are two over two for the mid-size windows, three foot six and four foot wide, types W1 and W5 on the applicant's drawing. And also three over three with an unusual configuration. Um, these wider windows have wide central panes and narrow flanking panes at each of the sash for the wider windows. These are types W2, W3, W4, W6, and W7 on the applicant's drawing. Multi-light window configurations are an important feature of arts and craft style buildings. But the one over one windows proposed for every opening will perpetuate the current inappropriate configuration. We recommend that new windows match the historic configuration, a significant feature of this building. As far as we can see, no LPC permits have been issued for window replacement on the primary facades of the building since the time of the 2015 designation. This application will set the precedent. We strongly urge the commission to require the applicants to modify their proposal to conform to the historic window configurations and urge staff to reach out to the building owners to develop a window replacement master plan. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. Um, that's it for signups, and I do not see any other hands raised for this item. Okay, thank you. And I think we did get uh, one more letter. So let me just check. Yeah, uh, we had a community board seven recommending approval of the application, and the West End Preservation Society um, also recommended approval of the application. Okay, so um, let me turn back to the applicant and see if you would like to respond to the comments we've heard. Mr. Carmen? No, no comments. Okay, commissioners, do we have any final questions? Okay, I'm gonna start to send my requests to unmute. All right, Commissioner Chen, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? We second the motion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? OK, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. And so, commissioners, um, this is an application for one apartment, not for a master plan, as we often see, um, for a change in con uh, uh, for a window that doesn't match the historic window in terms of its configuration and um, details. So the sort of applicant, I think, is making the argument that the window would match the other remaining windows. 
um, and we've heard testimony about the um, recommending approval uh, if they match the historic windows. So let's begin our discussion. We've had, you know, as we know, many discussions about windows around this table, and um, we have sort of more recently started to look at the prominence of the building, the style and a level of ornament on the building and whether the level of ornament is so spare that the windows are needed to understand the style. That's been a reason to um, require that historic return of the historic window where all of the others have been replaced. So um, something to think about here at this site. Commissioner Bland, would you start this one? Um, I had to take a call. Oh, and sure. I want to listen to others first. Okay. All right. Um, how about Commissioner Shamir Barron? Would you do this one? Sure. Uh, <laughs> well, I think that we should begin somewhere and that in the replacement of these windows, they should revert back to a historic configuration. Okay. Commissioner Holford Smith. I agree. I think there's no real um, justification for doing one of the lines everywhere. Uh, just because they're there now. Um, so I think that they should go back to the original configuration. Okay, Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's a, an issue that we're confronting a lot over time. Uh, but I, I think I agree with the two previous commissioners. I mean, the one suggestion I might make is because people want to change these windows for view, I don't know how other commissioners would feel about like a compromise in which it would be a three over one or a two over one, uh, but that you would have division divided lights on the upper uh, uh, section. Anyway, uh, mm -hmm. I don't think it should be one over one throughout. Okay. All right. Thank you. And that is a, a sort of compromise we've done in the past to get back to the spirit of the original configuration. Commissioner Devonshire. I agree with my colleagues about reverting to the original configuration. Okay. Commissioner Chen? Yeah, likewise, yeah. I think this is something we have struggled with. And uh, how do you apply the applicable standard? Uh, and I think this is uh, something that the commission has to continue to deal with. Yeah. Okay. Commissioner um, Lutfi? So I uh, generally tend to... Uh, feel like once a building's been uh, pretty much converted to 101, one over ones, especially when the architecture is strong, that we should go with that. But in this particular arts and crafts style building, I feel like the fact that the building has these different window configurations, you know, the three over three and one over one and the uh, two over two. It, I feel like it's an important part of the style of the building. So I think that we should probably go back to the original, but I really feel strongly <laughs> that this, we should strongly encourage this building to do a master plan. And because I also feel that the type of windows, once we, we uh, if we go back to this, or if we go back to a modified version of it that Diana had suggested, um, I, I think the kind of windows we, uh, the building uses are important. And it may not, maybe it shouldn't be an aluminum window. Maybe it should be, you know, a wood flat aluminum build window. Uh, I, I just think it's, uh, we, sh we should be thoughtful and the building needs to be thoughtful about this. And I agree, I think the building needs to be thoughtful. I just, with respect to the master plan, really the, the master plan is a, a way to think of it is a administrative tool that we use to do faster approvals that don't require as many submission materials. So we approve something once in a prototype once, and then that allows an expedited review later on because they don't have the applicant doesn't have to submit all the same drawings over and over. Um, but 
And so if that initial prototype required commission approval, it's a huge benefit to the building. They don't have to go to a public hearing every time. If the window that they are, uh, are seeking to install or that they have an approval to install is something that would m match the historic window and be eligible for a staff level review, that master plan is kind of like a, a little bit less of a um, tool because it's a staff level review anyway, although it still would reduce the amount of materials they have to submit each time. And again, with respect to the window manufacturer, even in a master plan, the staff would be looking at details, not a particular, not requiring a particular manufacturer. So it's, it all comes down to the details of the window that's approved. Well, that is true. But what happens when a bill, as you know, when a building actually has to face this issue of a master plan, everybody is, for, for starting with the board, uh, you know, the window, the building has to get on board with it. And there's not a, um, every time someone changes their windows, I mean, some might decide to do skyline windows and someone might decide to do Marvin windows. And I'm, there's still a lot of variation that happens when there's not a master plan. So I- but Yeah, even, uh, even that is true, but remember even with a master plan, we can approve a skyline window, but then if someone submits a panorama window that shows that they're matching the details, those would be approved under that master plan as well. Mm -hmm. unless, so, the, unless, the, unless, the, unless the building decides they're going with a particular window. Right, which they can do on their own. And I do think, you know, your idea of a master plan for planning purposes is an excellent one that every building should really undertake because I think it makes, um, you know, communication with the shareholders and the apartment owners much more clear. It makes the expectations clear and everybody knows what everybody's supposed to do and can plan for it and even financially plan for it. Um, but the way that we use that term is really is it's related to a process. It's related to how many materials you have to submit with the application. So we use that term in a much more narrow way. It's more about this administrative process. Mm -hmm. Got it. But I agree with you, the building should do some planning and lay out some expectations. And ideally, should we come to a decision today that that would set the standard for future applications? And, you know, whatever slight variations there might be that might be approved at staff level, um, that those variations would not be perceptible. Okay, Com Commissioner Bland. What I didn't hear is, um, are the majority of the windows now one over one? I didn't they're, hear. They're all one over one. They're all one over one, whereas the originals were three over three, is that it? The originals were, uh, there were some three, two over two and some three over three in the wider openings. And it was unusual in that the, the uh, it wasn't a, uh, equal panes of three over three. It was a wider center pane and two narrower end panes. Well, the, the, that fact that most, most are one over ones now and that um, this, single application of one apartment may set the story for the rest of the building. It puts a high, pretty high price here on what we're gonna say. And I feel slightly underprepared because I had to leave this conversation for a while, but I am the last one to speak. So my uh, vote may be uh, not, not with the majority. But, uh, uh, but I, do, I do feel that, um, you know, and this hasn't been proposed that maybe something like a three over one might be appropriate, but I, I, I find that, you know, just to do it for this one apartment, and it, sorry, have it apply to the rest of the building over time is too heavy a price. So I'm not sure what I really think about this, but I do think that conformity is important and it, it's hard for me to judge right now, honestly, whether conformity with one over ones uh, uh, 
is more important than going back to the original. But I, I think I might favor that, but that places me completely in the minority. So and, therefore, I'll be in the minority. Okay, and that is, you know, I mean, that's also a, a valid position though. The commission has made yeah. that decision in the past that when yeah. all of the windows have been replaced and it's only one apartment, that the new windows could match the, the rest of the other windows for conformity's sake. I'll, I'll say one other thing on that, and maybe it's slightly off topic though. You know, the Landmarks Commission exists uh, when people love the Landmarks Commission and love the fact that we're protecting them. And I think most people who live in these kinds of buildings where they have replaced uh, whatever they've had with one over ones, uh, want to keep the one over ones for obvious reasons. And uh, it flies in the face. We make a lot of enemies unless we're really sure that they're a crucially important thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm maybe I'm just bending a little bit too much with the reality of the situation as opposed to the, uh, the, the, the you know the academic results of what the building ought, ought to be or maybe was at one time. Yeah. Anyway, I'll, I'll stay with my one over one. I think uh, I'll accept the, the presentation and uh, be a minority of one. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, sometimes I've gone along with one over one. I think some of the windows here are old enough, though, that it may be that we'll start to see others. And so maybe this is um, the point to start thinking about right, what the right window is. And I, I agree with Commissioner Lutfi in that I often, um, where all of the windows have been replaced prior to designation, have supported a one over one in cases where the architecture um, is really strong and can, and, and the level of our, our ornament and articulation can, and the style can sort of be legible with any window type. Um, and, but, and I agree again, you know, with Commissioner Lutfi again, that in this case, it does seem like these windows were sort of unusual in their configuration on a, you know, relatively simple facade and a prominent corner. So in this case, I would support uh, windows that match the historic windows as well. So I think we could make that motion um, with the recommendation that they match the historic windows. Um, and then, you know, with respect to doing a, a sort of modified configuration, I think, um, you know, I think, I think, as you mentioned, Fred, that it's, um, you know, to sort of start something that is neither here nor there in one apartment does seem a little sort of arbitrary and that maybe there'd be more comfort level with a modified configuration if it actually was a proper master plan where we would be sure that people would be taking advantage of that as, as for instance forward. a three over one sounds like a reasonable compromise but we, you know we have to see it and understand it more. yeah to see it and understand it and i think you know knowing that it comes with a plan for the whole building i think would make us all feel more comfortable so why don't we go ahead and make the motion I, I, match the historic configuration I, for now. I did not, I oh, I'm sorry. Did I skip you? Oh, please go ahead. Forgive me. Oh, I, I, that's okay. I believe in the principle of origi original intent of the architect. Okay. So I think um, let's go ahead and make a motion to approve with the modifications that they match the original configuration. And if they would like to explore some other version, they can come back to us in some other form with a different application. Okay, Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you make the motion? So moved. Oh, no, will you read the motion? Oh, I'll read it. <laughs> I am. Okay. <sighs> in the matter of LPC 2108658, 780 West End Avenue, Riverside, West End Historic District, Extension 2, an arts and crafts style apartment building designed by George and Edward Blum and built in 1912 to 14, the application is to replace windows. The I note that the building style scale materials and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Riverside West Historic District, Extension 2. And I recommend approval with some modifications finding 
that the historic windows of the primary facades are replaced, were replaced prior to the designation of the historic district. Therefore, the proposed work will not alter, damage, or destroy any significant architectural features. That the proposed double hung windows will match. Will match. Um, am I saying that? Or no, no, no. Oh, yeah. So um, okay. So yeah, yes, you can yes, continue. It yes, says it matches the operation. Those double hung windows will match the historic windows in terms of operation, and the use of painted metal and louvre wood will be imperceptible. And the proposed white finish will match the finish of the existing windows to remain, thereby supporting a unified fenestration pattern. However, I find that the proposed one over one windows will not match the historic two over two and three over three windows in terms of configuration and possibly profiled brick molds, um, which contributed to the unique arts and crafts style of the building. And I therefore recommend that the configuration and details of the proposed windows match the historic windows. Okay, and Commissioner Holford Smith, would you second the motion? I second it. All right, and Mark, will you call the vote? Yeah. Uh, Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Nay. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With eight in favor and one opposed, the motion passes. All right, so that's approved with those modifications. And so please work with the staff to match the historic configuration. Commissioner Jefferson, did you want to add something or was no, the I'm hand? Fine. No, okay, fine. I think that your hand is up from before. Okay. All right, so that's done. Um, that's the last item for today. So that concludes our day. Thank you, commissioners, for your dedication, commitment, and long hours. And thank you to the public who joined us today. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.